From the future, Mr. Gitz, it's the IGN DigiGods. Please welcome the two men who shot Liberty Valance, Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. I don't know what to make of that, that intro. That's an interesting combo. Uh, Corey, who sent that one in? That current reference was brought to you by Sam Current. Oh, that's funny. Amazing. Isn't it? You like how I have these conversations with Corey? Yes, Corey, who we recorded like four months ago. Very, very good, Wade. Uh, thank you. Wait, I can't hear myself. Yeah, there you go. How's that? Am, am I loud enough? You're loud enough. You're no. a little too loud, man. No, I'm not. Oh, here I am. Hello, yeah, folks. Because you have you have volume controls on the headphones as well. Yeah, I saw that. These are very <laughs> fancy headphones. Yes, they are. We run a uh, we we run a very uh, a high concept technological shop here, <laughs> Digigods. I guess, yeah. Well, woo. Uh, why did you give me this recipe? Oh, I bought a stand. Okay, wait. Here's the thing. Yeah, I, a, I, I every week a stand it's a different mixer. thing. Yeah, you bought a stand. Uh, the, uh, the mixer's uh, name is Stan. Yes. I bought a, a stand mixer, oh, KitchenAid. I see, yes. Cost me $380. Okay. And that was with a 20% off a Bed Bath & Beyond coupon. Uh, so, look, if you go into Bed Bath & Beyond and you don't get 20% off, you're a moron. <laughs> Those things are like they grow on trees and they don't and there's no expiration on them by the way. You know that. Well, also, you know, even though they say it expires, like the, there is no store anywhere in the United States where Bed Bath & Beyond actually honors the expiration date <laughs> that, or, or enforces it. There's not a single one. You can bring one in from like 1927. And they'll, they won't care. And you can literally go to Bed Bath & Beyond, request a coupon, and yes. you just give them your email address? Yes. Well, you can go and create a phony Yahoo address 100 at a time. You do realize that I, I, I get those 20% off coupons in every single one of the like dozen email addresses that I have. Which I don't use for anything. and They're just there to receive coupons. Well, here's the thing. I bought a stand mixer, and I love it. It's fantastic. <sighs> I can't believe I live without it, but I... Used it this weekend to make a cookie recipe yeah. that I got from a Martha Stewart cookie DVD. Oh, that's great. How bad could these cookies be? Martha Stewart DVD. It's all coming together. Wade, these cookies were horrible, and I want you to have one because I want to get rid of them. You just gave me a recipe, the first ingredient of which is three packages no, no, of no. soda crackers. No, 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 no. I know. It was, it was an older woman who gave this to me. This, three okay, first three of all, packages no, of soda crackers? Here, you, okay. I, I'm going to get you one of these cookies because they're really bad, <sighs> and, and, and I, I want to get rid of them because I don't like them. Oh, my god. They're really bad cookies. They're the worst ever. So you talk. Here's the thing. Here's what's going to happen. Yeah. I'm going to go get you your cookie. Yeah. Which you will not like because they are terrible. That's and, fabulous. And, and, and F Martha Stewart because totally. this thing was terrible. And then I'm going to give people the recipe mm-hmm. for these uh, saltine crackers yep. that will literally make you the hit of I'm any sure party. They will. It, 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 th- these saltines were so tasty, yeah, huh. I, I, I wanted a plot. Okay. So you talk about that. <laughs> you wanted I a what? Plots. It's Yiddish. Okay. Uh, wow. I will get you the cookie. You will talk about that DVD. Then I will mm. come back, and you will tell us how horrible the cookie is. Yeah. And then I will give everybody the recipe for these saltine crackers that are oh so good, okay. so easy to make. People will think you're a superstar. Go, Wade, go. Uh, you know, we got a bunch of stuff, a bunch of great stuff, uh, classical Blu-rays here. And uh, we, we hit these every once in a while. And these classical Blu-rays are all absolutely outstanding, lovely. Uh, Giuseppe Verdi's Macbeth, the opera, not the Shakespearean play, but the opera, is performed by the Royal Opera House, and it is on Blu-ray from Opus Arte, and it is, uh, it's terrific. Really, really good. Being not a huge opera buff, I, uh, I can't vouch for who any of these people are, but it, uh, it's pretty great. It, Macbeth is great. I saw Macbeth on stage, uh, the Shakespeare version with Patrick Stewart, and I would say this is just as, just as mind-blowing. You know what's a, a that looks like 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 a pile of dog poo. You know what Larry that Miller? Cookie. You know what Mary, uh, Larry Miller says about opera? What does he say? You can't get sleep like that at home. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Mahler Symphony Number no. Nine. Mahler is an assumed ta- assumed acquired taste, and uh, you know some people just think he's just long and bombastic and over boisterous, and uh, you know sometimes they're right. But the Ninth Symphony by Mahler, I think, is a pretty great piece of music. And uh, this is on Blu-ray, performed uh, at, the, at the behest of the great Claudio Abado. I have no idea who he is. 
Uh, and uh, you know what? Um, it's a really good performance. I, I can't uh, vouch for why he's a he's a great conductor. In fact, I'm not sure that I really know that, that uh, who he is or why I should care. But uh, this is from 2004, and it was performed in Italy, in Rome, and it's uh, it's awfully good. Uh, again, the audio is the thing here. Don't expect to go like, oh my gosh, the the the, the picture is so crazy. Just it's, Wait, it's, it's, no- it's a violinist. N- I guarantee nobody listening to this podcast will Cares. ever make that mistake because yeah, they'll never buy it or rent it. Uh, Puccini's Madame, Madame Butterfly, otherwise known as Madame Butterfly. This is, uh, you know, it's like M. Butterfly with music. Uh, this is also really, really good. Great, great, great sound. I love Puccini. Puccini's music is just first-rate, great uh, operatic music. And uh, this, is, um, this is really, really good stuff. It's not a terribly long opera. It's less than two and a half hours long. So for people who think operas are way too long, that's a nice one. Uh, speaking of long, Wagner's Tannhauser is like everything Wagner is just is like it's it's freaking endless. Uh, at least it feels endless. And uh, this is like f- it, this is like four hours long or something. Anyway, um, you know what? The great music again. The, the audio is just absolutely killer. And uh, if you like Wagner, man, you're gonna crank that thing up. Get some good speakers going. Get the get the Blu-ray cranked up. It'll just it'll wow your neighbors or, or make them kill you. And uh, then lastly is this thing by uh, Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov that I have never in my life ever heard of. Uh, le coq d'or, which is, which means the golden uh, rooster. Uh, I, I've, I've never heard of this thing. I have no idea what it is. The others, obviously, all very familiar with. And I'm not. Uh, this again is an opera, and I'm not uh, terribly familiar with Rimsky-Korsakov's operas. But uh, apparently, this is an important one. And uh, again, sound is really, really spectacular. I can't exactly tell you that I had any idea what was going on. It's kind of an Asian thing, and I, I really didn't follow the plot very well. But didn't need to. Music was decent, but, you know, not great. So I, of all I, of them, I'm going to recommend uh, probably I'm going to go with the Mahler, the Macbeth, and the Tannhauser. Madam Butterfly, if you have to, the, the Cockdor, if you know, you're know you a Rimsky-Korsakoff fan. And I know there's a lot of them among our listeners, don't oh you think? Oh, my God. Yeah. However, there, there are fans of cookies. And, Wade, I want you to try this cookie. <sighs> And you have not tried this cookie, and, and, and we're not making this up. I got the stand mixer. I loved it. It's so easy. You don't need a hand mixer. I'm not going to escape the cookie, am you I? You are not. It, it is the worst cookie ever. And, and you know what? F Martha Stewart because uh, – Talk about non-opera her, music no, and I'm performance. Go, I, while you do, I'm going to give people this recipe. This, is, this oh, recipe geez. for the crackers is something that – okay, hang on a second. I want to get your reaction to this horrible cookie. Go. I'm eating a cookie now. <laughs> it's like peanut butter or something in it. Well, it's supposed to be a peanut butter surprise cookie, but it's like, you know, they make you mix the peanut butter with brown sugar, so it just tastes like brown sugar peanut butter, and there's not enough peanut butter in the cookie. It tastes like feces. No, it doesn't. (laughs) It's a terrible cookie. I just wanted to say feces on on the podcast. Okay. Do I have to eat the whole thing? Well, I'm going to throw away whatever you don't need. So either it's going into you or it's going into the garbage. It's garbage, man. Why? Oh, okay, scale of one to ten. Ten being best cookie ever, one being worst. Go. I, look, it's not my recipe, so I, I'm, I'm not embarrassed. You, you've tried my food. My, my cookies are good. This is a terrible cookie. So on a scale of one to ten, ten being uh, the ultimate uh, cookie of life, and then one being, uh, you know, it, uh, it kills you. What would you give this cookie? I don't know, like a three. Oh, really? yeah, you know what? I kind of agree. I, I, you know what? I love cookies, so I'd say a four because I love cookies. 3.2. Now, here, okay, so forget the cookie. I'm throwing the rest away. Um, okay, I, I totally agree. Stupid Martha Stewart. This is what we go through for, for our listeners. I know. Uh, by the way, this has nothing to do with DVDs, but I swear. Not, nothing. Uh, okay, here, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you something that is honestly, truly useful. <coughs> I go... <laughs> Wow, that bad. <laughs> uh, you know what? I literally, I, I gave it to my mother. I said, Ma, try this. You, on Mother's Day, right? You yes, sadistic it was. bastard. I said, Ma, try this. She takes two bites, and she literally throws the rest in the garbage herself. She didn't wait for me to throw it into the garbage. She threw it into the garbage herself. Okay. Anyway, point being, a cookie didn't taste good. Okay. Okay. I went to a birthday party over the weekend. Uh, this, uh, there was all sorts of food. Sure. Uh, this woman, older woman, really sweet, older woman makes... Uh, there's a tray of saltine crackers. Okay. And I try these saltine crackers, and they are unbelievably good. Mm-hmm. It's saltine crackers that are a little bit 
moist, almost like they've been uh, like it, like they have like they're coated in oil, and there's like some red pepper flakes. Maybe it's like a ranch dressing thing going on with these crackers. They're unbelievably good, and and when you eat these crackers, you think that you that somebody has slaved for three days over a hot something to yeah. make these crackers. Right. Turns out it is so easy, and I'm telling you, it doesn't cost a lot of money. If you go into a, a you know a, a party, a Super Bowl party, or an Oscar party, or a Fourth of July party, and you don't have a lot of money, and you want to make like a dip and maybe some crackers to go with it, this recipe is amazing. I'm gonna give it to you right now. I'm telling you, and I want yeah. somebody to make this and tell me how awesome it is at gods at digigods.com. Here's how you make this recipe. And by the way, uh, I, I'm literally blowing ten minutes on a one hour DVD podcast uh-huh. on this because it's so good. Okay, you ready? This is mm. it. This, by the way, is not a joke. I had it, it was a birthday party. Uh, this woman had made these crackers. Everybody was hovering over these crackers, young and old, hovering around these crackers, eating them like like literally everybody was a starving dog. It was so good and so easy to make. Okay, you go to the store and you buy a box of saltine crackers, very regular all-American saltine crackers. And you know when you open up a box of saltine crackers, it comes in four little, little packages, little cellophane packages. Take three of those packages. Don't take the four, take three. Put them aside. You take one and a third cup of canola oil. Not sure why canola oil, that's what she uses. One third a cup of canola oil one package of Hidden Valley Ranch dressing. Now, that's not the actual uh, liquid dressing. It's the little uh, packet, like uh, the dried packet. So you get one and a third cups of canola oil, one package of the dried Hidden Valley Ranch dressing, and one or two tablespoons of red pepper flakes, which can also, by the way, be substituted for uh, Parmesan cheese. So we're talking uh, a third of a, uh, one and a third cups of canola oil, one package of dried Hidden Valley Ranch dressing. I just posted something to say to the Facebook group. I, I, I'm, I, I'm horrified to know what it could be. <laughs> one or two <laughs> tablespoons of red pepper flakes or Parmesan cheese, and you mix them all together. You mix together the canola oil. You mix together the uh, uh, Hidden Valley Ranch uh, uh, dried uh, uh, dressing, and you mix together the pepper flakes and or the Parmesan cheese. Then what you do is you lay out the crackers into a container the three packages of soda crackers into a container. And then you drizzle the oil, Hidden Valley Ranch, pepper flake, Parmesan cheese mixture into the crackers so that they seep into the crackers. Now, here's the thing. This is the key, Wade. And I know people are skipping this, but they're going to regret skipping this because it is really good and really cheap, and you will seem like a hero when you come to a party with these things. You've got to make them at least two days before because you need a couple of days for the oil, dressing, pepper flake, Parmesan cheese mixture to seep into the crackers. It's not going to make them soggy. It's still going to be a crunchy cracker. Uh, And then what you do is you keep it in the container, and twice a day you turn the container upside down. So that way all the crackers are being coated. So by the – and she said two days. She said make uh, make, uh, two days before, which is great. You do that. After two days, you try one of these. Don't rush it, Wade. I know you're going to take them out after a day and a half. Don't do it. Resist the temptation. Wait the full 48 hours. Flip. What, 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 are, you, what are you doing on Facebook? Someone already likes my Facebook post. It's wonderful. What did you say? I, you go, do I have to go on it myself? You have to go on it. This is a good recipe, and it's easy, and it's cheap, <laughs> and people will think you're a superstar. I'm telling you, for our listeners, okay. our listeners will, learn, will, will get more out of this recipe than some freaking opera you just talked about. So, so just turn the container over twice a day so that all the crackers get coated with the oil, ranch, pepper flake, Parmesan cheese mixture. And I'm telling you, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Young and old, they were hovering over this. I'm going on Facebook right now. So I don't <laughs> trust you. I don't know what you're putting on there. Deal with, deal with the music stuff, and um, I'll, 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 I'll hook up some foreign. I'm sure you will. Yeah. Uh, Dana Ross, live in Central Park. This is a legendary concert. This is from uh, 1983. She played, you know, there's been a bunch of concerts in Central Park, and each one is fantastic. But the Diana Ross one was especially groundbreaking. It is an amazing concert. You know, people have forgotten how great Diana Ross was. I mean, she's still around, doesn't really record that much anymore, if at all. But uh, all of her great songs are uh, here. Uh, Why Do Fools Fall in Love, which is considered kind of the first rock song ever made. Uh, she does cover Beat It. She covers Endless Love. Uh, but also, and Ain't No Mountain High Enough, but this is just great stuff. It's a DVD, unfortunately. First time on DVD, wish it was a Blu-ray. 
But uh, Diana Ross Live in Central Park is a great, classic, fabulous concert. Uh, Del Shores, he's a uh, this Del Shores. He's kind of a multi hyphenate. He's a, a director, producer, TV writer. He wrote a uh, used car salesman. Uh, I, I, you know what? If drug he is one, it's not. It's not uh, drug dealer. It's if he's if it could be. It's sure. not mentioned in my sordid life, which is the uh, which is a, a D, which is his uh, a DVD, sort of like a DVD chronicle of his life, telling his stories. Um, this guy, he re, he wrote a film called Daddy's Dying, Who's Got the Will, which I uh, do remember from 1990, an interesting movie, um, starring Bo Bridges and Beverly D'Angelo and Judge Reinhold. And uh, he also wrote, uh, he wrote for uh, Darwin Gregg, wrote for Ned and Stacey, Touched by an Angel. So he Jeez. definitely is, he, he, no, he definitely is an interesting guy. He's got a lot of great stories and Del Shores. You know, if you know who he is, which of course is probably nobody, you'd get a kick out of this. Otherwise, um, I'd probably pass on it. But you know what? He's definitely an interesting raconteur type of guy. Del Shore's my sordid life. Uh, also on the um, performance front, we have Ralphie May, too big to ignore. Oh, I love Ralphie May. He's one of the fat comics. Ralphie May is an enormous, enormous comic. I like and, fat um, comics. I, I like any comics who talk about uh, food. The thing is that is that I find that fat comics spend a lot of time talking about being fat. Which is always funny. Which is, I guess, always funny, but it's kind of like... I know. It's, it gets old, any, but... Is it, there you know. anything else you can talk about other than sure, being fat? Not, not really. When you're like 370 pounds, that's pretty much all anyone's paying attention to. Yeah, no. But Ralph Humay is very... He, you know what? He is very funny. Actually, when I was on The Man Show, uh, I used to produce... Uh, I produced the last two seasons of The Man Show on Comedy Central. He used to hang around uh, the set, and he was a funny guy. I think we, I think we got him on the show a couple times. So uh, Ralph Humay, too big to ignore uh, pretty funny stuff. Um... Now, when it comes to comedy, there is nobody better than Patton Oswalt at this point. And uh, Patton Oswalt has a DVD called Finest Hour. And this is, his, uh, this is a whole bunch of stand-up from him. And it is unbelievably funny. I love Patton Oswalt. He is brilliant. He is doing it like nobody else does. He approaches, he approaches things with honesty and wit and humor. And I just love him. And he's great. He is just great. He's the best. He is he's the, the best. best. I love him. Now this, he's, just the, he's, he's just the best. Now, this show is on Comedy Central, so maybe you caught it there. But there is some bonus stuff, including some extra uh, material, extra comedy material. But uh, if you like Patton Oswalt, and you should, check out Patton Oswalt Finest Hour. Uh, Bobcat Goldthwait is an interesting story because he um, was a stand-up and a performer, and then he became a film director. And I have to say that... Uh, He's become a very interesting film director where he, uh, he takes uh, premise, premises, mm-hmm. premises he takes premises that are very provocative and really sort of delves into them. He, it, it, they seem provocative on their face, almost vulgar on their face, but instead of playing it for its vulgarity, he actually winds up really exploring his stories, uh, most pointedly with Sleeping Dogs Lie, which uh, was flawed, but... An interesting try. World's Greatest Dad with Robin Williams, although it was terrific. Uh, his new film, not as great. Uh, God bless America, but still, Bobcat is an interesting guy. And here did you got... did you read that the uh, his his big uh, quitting Hollywood essay that he wrote? Uh, Mike Rotman posted on Facebook. You don't pay attention to anything Mike posts on Facebook, do you? I don't pay much attention to Facebook. It's a pretty great essay. Go check it out. It's really really good. It's just all about being true to your craft and how he you know he's he's happy to be rid of all the crap that he used to do. New life. You know what? I did read that. That's where he it's said really that good. like reality TV's crap. Yeah, pretty much. I, I read that. This is Bobcat. You don't look the same either, um, and it's great. It's great. Mm-hmm. He. It's. It's. This is, this is, this is a, a like a, a kind of a stand-up special. He charts his career, which has been going on for like thirty years now. He, you know, was big hit on the Tonight Show. He appeared a number of times on the Tonight Show. Of course, he was in uh, Police Academy. Now he's become a very interesting, low, low, low budget director. And he loves it. He loves. He loves his life now. And I'm glad he's using his powers for good and not evil. Yeah, which he was before. Making movies about bestiality and masturbation. And... But you know what? But Sleeping Dogs <laughs> Lie, which is the bestiality film, it, but that's an example of something where you look at it and you go, "Oh, it's a story of a woman who uh, gives her dog a, uh, oral sex." And you're like, "God, that just sounds like it's just some <laughs> frat boy BS." But you know what? He really. Delves into how this one decision from this well, woman that, ruins her life. That's what it is. He writes really twisted. I mean, his, his movies are not, they're not about shock value. They are about shocking subjects, but it's because he's willing to tell these stories about things that everyone else says, boy, that'd make a great, nah, never in a million years. And then no one else follows through. He follows through. 
Oh, yes, he does. Hi, yes, he does. Uh, elsewhere in the uh, comedy world, we have uh, Donald Glover Weirdo. Now, Donald Glover is... I like him. He, yeah, he's moderately new on the scene, but yeah. I do like him. And you know what I like about him in this um, DVD that was uh, shot at the Union Square Theater in New York? Is that he's kind of like a... He's a bit of a storyteller as much as he is a joke teller. And I always kind of appreciate that. Especially when he's telling jokes and stories about Cocoa Puffs. Because we all love Cocoa Puffs. So Donald Glover Weirdo is an up-and-coming comic. Uh, you should definitely check him out if you're into uh, stand-up comedy. Also, what else do we have? We have some um, we have some music stuff. We have uh, The Sun Came Out. Now, this is a... Uh, there was an album in 2001 that was a bit of an um, all-star album. It's called uh, Seven Worlds Collide. Now, Seven Worlds Collide featured some really interesting artists. Neil Finn, who was uh, was the founder and lead singer of Crowded House. Mm-hmm. And, you know, back in the 90s, Crowded House, they were a great band. They were, they, they wrote tight, Beatlesque, humorous, melodic songs. I love Crowded House. Uh, Eddie Vedder, Pearl Jam, Johnny Marr, the guitarist of the Smiths, a couple guys from Radiohead. They all uh, performed these concerts under the name Seven Worlds Collide, and it was a big success. So now this is sort of a chronicle of Seven Worlds Collide. And you know what? I didn't even know about this. and It was really kind of a New Zealand thing, but I didn't even really know much about this until this DVD came out because this is a serious all-star concert. I mean, uh, Neil Finn, great. Eddie Vedder, great. Johnny Marr, great. Anyone from Radiohead is great. Although Radiohead right, Radiohead right now is, they kind of have their head pretty far up their butt at this point. Unfortunately, but I, I do love Radiohead. And uh, anyway, Seven Worlds Collide is, is, a, is a great series of concerts um, out of New Zealand, and it's great, unique, fun, interesting music. And I highly recommend this DVD. The Sun came out, the making of the album Seven Worlds Collide. That's definitely good stuff. Uh, what else we have on the music front? We have we have uh, Alter Bridge live at Wembley. Now, this is, um, a, what was that? What was what? I don't know. I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, what I'm talking about is that there was just a, 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 a I heard a sound. Wait. You didn't hear anything. I did hear a sound. You need to throw that cookie in my head. It's, it's staring at me. It's like a like a cow patty. You need to understand that that cookie is so delicious. <laughs> and it was like the worst cookie ever. Anyway, Alter Bridge is, a, um, is sort of a little known hard rock outfit uh, they formed a couple years ago. And uh, I'm not a big uh, fan of their, um, I'm not a big fan of their music. Uh, mainly because some of these guys are members of Creed. And, Ew. And Creed is pretty much the worst band I ever. I don't like Creed. But uh, I don't like Creed. I don't either. really like that kind of music, but Creed is particularly it's icky. It's just the worst. Yeah. But uh, they did come together to create a thing called um, Alter Bridge Live at Wembley. This is from their European tour in 2011. To me, anything that keeps Creed from touring is probably a good thing. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. Um, but you got a bunch of their hits that I didn't even know existed because I don't like them, nor do I like Creed. But if you do like Creed, and I feel sorry for you then, you should check out uh, Alter Bridge Live at Wembley. This, by the way, is on Blu-ray, which is nice to see. We always like the concert stuff on Blu-ray. Don't we, Wade? We do. What do you, what do you yes, we do. There? What I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing foreign in a second. I'm, I'm ramping up for the big foreign blitz. I, I, I see what you have in your hand there. You like and, this movie. Um, huh? You like this movie. Uh, you know what? The, the, that movie that we're going to talk about in a second, yeah. it uh, came out uh, late last year. Should have done better. Should have done better. Mm-hmm. That's right. Okay, now uh, we have finally, uh, actually not finally, we have this too, uh, Al Demiola, whose name I can never pronounce. He is an interesting guy. He is a jazz fusion guitarist. He's really good. And he is amazing. Mm. And he's been around forever. He's from New Jersey. Jazz guitar is really cool. If people if people like jazz fusion guitar, if you haven't heard it, it's it's really great stuff. And by the way, when it comes to jazz, I know my jazz. You know why? Why? I was in New Orleans. Oh, that's right. You I were at Jazz to, Fest. I was. It's fantastic. Anyway, Al Di Miola has a new uh, Blu-ray called Morocco Fantasia, which is uh, great. It's got a lot of great songs on it. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not really familiar with like his individual songs. I can't name them, but I know I love his stuff. He's an amazing guitarist. He's from New Jersey. He's been around forever. He plays a lot. He plays guitar, plays keyboards, drums, cello. The guy's like amazing. Uh, so this um, Blu-ray, Morocco Fantasia, is a whole bunch of um, Al Dimiola music. Liked it a lot. 
There's also a photo gallery. There's a bunch of uh, extra features on there, too, including rehearsals and sound checks and whatnot. But if you do like this guy, and, uh, and you should because he's an amazing guitarist, check out Morocco, Fan- uh, Morocco Fantasia mm-hmm. from Al Di Miola. Al Di Miola. Finally, we have a little thing called Love. Ministry Fix. Now I don't like ministry. Huh? That's why that's why I pawned this off on you. I don't like ministry. Why don't why don't you like ministry? It's it's all that, you know, fringy crap. Look, I like I like bubblegum pop. I, I admit it. I like you know, I, I You be- like Umbop. Is is Umbop your favorite song ever? Uh, no, I like I like you know, here's what I like. I, I like that oh what is it what's the name of that act the the, the, the young singer who sings that new one? See I look Straight up to from we're talking from Olivia Newton-John through Sheena Easton through Debbie Gibson and Tiffany uh, right up to Britney Spears. That that's my scene, man. That right there. That's as hardcore as I get. Uh, you are oh, sure? and did I mention uh, Kylie Minogue? Throw Kylie in there because she rules. Really? Oh yeah. Get out of your mind. But you know who I don't get? I don't get uh, the 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 the, uh, the the what's her name? The uh, ex Mrs. Russell Brand. Oh, Katy Perry? Yeah, I don't get that. I don't think... I, you know what? I just don't listen to music anymore. I don't really Music's get terrible. that. Uh, anyway, finally, we have um, um, uh, from Ministry. Ministry is that, uh, you know, that industrial metal crap. Yeah. And they have a movie out called Fix. Uh, if you get the DVD, there's a poster and a CD inside, which I guess is nice, whatever. But, um, yeah, these these guys, they formed, like, in the 80s. They've been around forever. And... This particular uh, DVD is meh. It's got a bunch of decent guest stars, though, which is kind of nice. Nine Inch Nails is there. Uh, Motorhead. Who doesn't love them? Some Lemmy from mm. Motorhead. Jello Biafra, who I haven't heard from in a while, is there. Jello Biafra is great. Jane's Addiction, of course, is classic. Love Jane's Addiction. And uh, anyway, this is a, it's a documentary film about um, a bowl about ministry and their music and whatnot. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it's already premiered. It actually premiered at the Chicago International Movies and Music Festival. So it's been out there. But um, now it is finally on DVD, and you can check out uh, Fix if you're a fan of Mystery, which neither Wade and I are. Okay, foreign films. we got a trio right now from the new line of Fox World Cinema, and uh, they're all good. They're all really good. Uh, this is a, you know, a new branded line that Fox is doing, and uh, it's uh, hopefully going to highlight some of these films for people who otherwise wouldn't really pay attention to foreign language films. And these are all much more on the commercial end of things. These aren't, you know, sort of meditative Eastern European films about people contemplating life and sitting on park benches and staring into the fog. Uh, these these have action and uh, genre elements that would, you know, be great in uh, American Hollywood studio films if uh, studio films were interested in doing good films anymore. Uh, Miss Bala was the Mexican submission for the Academy Awards last year, and it is pretty terrific. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see this thing get badly remade by a studio. Uh, it's basically about a woman who who winds up being drawn into this horrible, horrible, uh, like, hostage. Well, she becomes kind of a tool of the Mexican drug lords uh, after she is a witness to this nightclub uh, shootout. And it is really intense. It is really well directed, really well acted. Just a, a sensational film all through. Really nicely done. Continues to confirm for me that Mexican cinema is spectacular these days. Just nonstop great young Mexican directors coming around. Uh, also from the Fox World Cinema line, The Yellow Sea, which is uh, a really, really intriguing story about a Chinese guy who is hired to be an assassin uh, or to carry out an assassination in South Korea. And, of course, the whole thing is all about a double-cross, triple-cross, you know, secret this and that and the other thing. Uh, Very interesting film. A bit implausible, but nonetheless very, very well done. I think they're trying a little too hard in a lot of Asian countries to keep up this thing that happened during the Hong Kong New Wave where everything was kind of out Hollywooding Hollywood. They shouldn't try that anymore. Uh, and then also The Hidden Face, which is a Spanish-language film that's uh, super chilling and creepy uh, about a woman who uh, wants to... She, she eavesdrops on her boyfriend, who is a conductor, to see if he's cheating on her. And, of course, uh, she eavesdrops and... Dun, dun, dun. There are other things going on. Oh, if only he were just cheating on her. My goodness. Uh, so really good stuff here. All of them very remake-worthy. And now we get to what may be the uh, one of one of the two major foreign language films of the uh, of the week. There are two huge foreign language film releases. Mark, I'm gonna let you be the deciding factor because I don't because they're both really good, 
Uh, I obviously have my preference, but the other one, uh, which I dislike, a lot of people are probably going to be more excited about. Now, the one I have in my hand is the Blu-ray of La N, otherwise known as Hate, the Mathieu Kassovitz film that was uh, really such a huge sensation in 1995. I cannot believe it's been 17 years since uh, Kassovitz came out with this thing. Uh, this it's amazing. This Vincent Cassell is so unbelievably young in this. It just it, I can't, I don't know where the time went. Uh, all shot in black and white, really stylish, and pretty much the first film to really deal head on with uh, ethnic strife in the suburbs of Paris, and to really kind of shine a spotlight on that ugly part of French culture. You know, where it's it's not uh, that beautiful pastoral uh, jewels and gym and. Uh, French countryside and period Louis the Sixteenth stuff. This is just ugly, urban, um, hard hitting, hard driving, tough the real stuff. France. The real France. It, you know what? This this really goes on. I saw it in in January all over again, and it's it's a it's really a tough look at it, and it hasn't gotten any better. It's gotten worse. So this film is very much as timely now as it was then if not more so. Uh, heaps of great special features on here. Uh, Kasovitz does an audio commentary that is uh, just excellent. Uh, Jodie Foster does an intro, which is because Jodie Foster at the time sponsored the film, did the Jodie Foster Presents thing in order to get it released here. People forget that. Jodie Foster facilitated the release of this film. Uh, you get a uh, 10 years later documentary, uh, featurettes on uh, all kinds of uh, other little tidbits and doodads, and um, a gallery of photos. It's, uh, it's a great, just a, a great, great film. And uh, there's even an, an ap- appreciation from 2006 by Costa Gavras. Now, the other big foreign language film release of the week, and this is worth talking about a little bit, is 1900, the Bertolucci, Bert- Bernardo Bertolucci film in a three-disc collector's Blu-ray uh, from Paramount. And I've always been kind of surprised that Paramount hung on to this film. Um, Here's the thing. The the movie itself has been... There are two different cuts of it uh, over the years. And uh, this is the 315-minute director's edition. And this is the cut that I think is crap. There is a, a significantly shorter version uh, of the 1977 film, which I think... Which was like the original one released, which I think is better. But that version apparently doesn't exist anymore. Bertolucci has gone with the longer one, which I just think is just interminable, absolutely interminable. I mean, this is like six hours or whatever. I saw this thing in two parts some years ago at uh, at the New Art. You know, it was on, on uh, sequential nights. And it's just, it's awful. Um, it's a well-made film, but it's just interminable. And he, what he tries to do is paint this massive tapestry of the year 1900 and all of the, the social unrest and the political ins and outs and to suggest exactly what's, uh, what's going on in Italy and how it's going to impact the future of Italy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, gosh, you know, Donald Sutherland uh, overacts like crazy. Burt Lancaster shows up. Uh, Robert De Niro is in it. Bert, uh, Gerard Depardieu is dubbed in the most ridiculous way possible. And then, of course, you have that fabulous scene where the cam- where, where they're lying together in bed with a woman, with, and the camera comes up over the end, and she, they're both naked, and you see everything that De Niro and Depardieu have. And this woman is two-handing the both of them, and boy, what a shot I never wanted to see in a movie. Mm-hmm. That being said, Mark, do you like 1900? Which version? <laughs> There's so many. Uh, anyway, it's out there. Uh, you know what? I, I, I. It's such a look. If you're gonna fail, fail big. I guess. And I think this film failed. Look, big. look. Visually, it, 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 great Blu-ray. Paramount did a lovely job on it. It preserves the grain. It's you know, it's a, it, it really is a, a very pristine transfer. But I just I can't vouch for the movie. Look, the the, the one Bertolucci film I would love to see on Blu-ray is The Conformist. Oh, gosh, which I no think kidding. is just the most unbelievably beautiful Overdue. shot film ever. I, I just love that film. Why is that not on Blu-ray? Way make have it no happen. Idea. Strand has also released Michael, a film by Marcus Schleinzer. Now, Marcus Schleinzer has been uh, closely associated with Michael Haneke over the last few years, and uh, this is his directing debut, and it is a total Haneke type film. It is so close to Haneke, it, it's it's hard to to. It, it's almost hard to watch it because you feel like he's imitating Haneke. It's a well-made film. It's just it's, there's too much. It, it's just too close to Haneke's style. Basically, the story of a um, 
an insurance agent who uh, kidnaps a boy and keeps him locked in the basement and does that whole kind of prisoner surrogate child thing, and uh, which goes on way too often in our society, and it's even happened too much in Austria, frankly. And it's really, really freaking creepy. And it's meant to be creepy, and it uh, just chills you to the bone, and it, it goes into some very dark places in a very effective way. I just wish that he weren't so completely parroting Haneke's style in the most obvious way possible. But uh, that being said, you know, it's, it's all he knows. And then real quickly, uh, blow through some Asian films um, that we haven't talked about in a while. Tron Unhung, the Vietnamese filmmaker who basically makes French-language films that are sort of Vietnam-centric, made a movie called Norwegian Wood based on a Japanese novel by Haruki Murakami. And uh, Norwegian Wood got a little bit of traction uh, this last year when it was released. It takes place in Tokyo in the 1960s. And uh, that's always a little bit interesting, uh, just to sort of, uh, you know, because Japan in the 1960s is sort of the birth of modern-day Japan. It's when they were getting over World War II, and there's a new generation that's starting to, you know, essentially modernize Japan in a post-fascist world. And uh, that's where, you know, industrial Japan kind of is birthed. And uh, Rinko Kikuchi, who was in Babel, is wonderful in this film, I think. Otherwise, it's just a little bit threadbare, but... uh, Nicely done, generally speaking. Uh, some great Hong Kong action films, Let the Bullets Fly, with Chow Yun-Fat, Zhang Wen, and Gay Yu is really off. It's just awesome. Uh, Zhang Wen directed it himself, and uh, Zhang Wen, of course, has been a great actor in a lot of films. He was a star of uh, Zhang Yimou's uh, Red Sorghum, his directing debut. And uh, this is just a, a cool kind of almost noir style thrillery thing. It's almost like a noir western uh, set in you know sort of turn of the century China and uh, it, without giving away too much because it's it's a really clever it's a clever script. It's about a bandit, a government representative, and uh, a something of a warlord, and how they keep playing these games, and the one assumes the identity of the other in exchange for his life, and uh, it's all about who's going to control the power in this small village. It's really fun. A lot of good action, a lot of good comedy, three great actors. Uh, Confucius, also starring Chow Yun-Fat, is, uh, is a big sprawling epic about the great Chinese philosopher. And I wish it were better. It's sort of more for the eyes than it is for the brain. Uh, they don't really uh, go out of their way to, you know, give you any kind of... It's not like it's, uh, you know, it's not that deep, quite frankly, which is ironic because it's about Confucius. But um, it's almost, it's, it really wants to be more about the history of China and, uh, you know, big battle scenes and big crowd scenes and really, really just lay on the, uh, the epicness thick, very thick. And at that, it's very nice. It's a Blu-ray combo pack. Both of these, actually, are Blu-ray combo packs. And uh, very, very nicely executed. A little bit less interesting, War of the Arrows. This is a Korean film. Uh, this is also a combo pack from uh, uh, Wellgo. And uh, big epic battle scenes, again, just huge. It's, uh, you've seen this story a million times. It's all about uh, f- warlords and dynasties clashing on the battlefield. And it probably means a lot more to people who are into Korean history. I'm not that much into Korean history, but, you know, nice to look at. Speed through uh, the stuff where they're talking and just watch the big battle scenes. Uh, Aaron Kwok and Shu Ke are just both spectacular in the very uh, youth-oriented City Under Siege by action director Benny Chan, who's one of the last action guys who's still holding down the fort in Hong Kong. Another combo pack, this one from Funimation. And uh, you know what? Uh, Don't worry about what it's about. It's just got great action, and again, you can fast-forward past anything that uh, looks like people are talking because there's nothing else much worth watching. Uh, Donnie Yen uh, holds down the fort in Blade of Kings. Uh, Jackie Chan also uh, shows up very ever so briefly. And I got to say, Jackie's son, J.C. Chan, can't act. Shouldn't, shouldn't be in a movie. Um, when Donnie Yen's on screen, terrific. Uh, great uh, action directing from Corey Yun, who, of course, was a childhood uh, buddy of uh, Jackie Chan's from the same school and who's done a lot of Jet Li's choreography. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's not much else going on here either. It's good Blu-ray, good quality, good looking, but uh, unless Donnie Yen is fighting, forget about it. The front line, Last Battle of the Korean War, is a huge, massive Korean War epic 
Uh, this is a bit of a theme. Y- you're going to want to skip all the drama stuff. It's just sappy, melodramatic crap, uh, except for all the war stuff. The war scenes are sensational. Really good stuff to show off your sound system, especially. I was amazed by the sound mixing in that film. And then lastly, my voice cracked there. Uh, lastly uh, is The Woman Night of Mirror Lake. This is one of those titles that uh, only flies and only makes sense if you speak Chinese, I guess. Anyway, this is uh, late 19th century China, and uh, it's going to make absolutely no sense to people who don't have a, a grasp of uh, Chinese history. It's a little bit of a, an espionage intrigue thing, but uh, movies with strong female characters are always a little bit fun. This one's kind of second tier uh, for genre fans only, I would say. And with that, we're done with foreign. How was that, Mark? I like it. I blew through that. Oh, you blew all right. Nobody blows harder than you. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, bam yeah. New, that, So we should, we should get into uh, oh, new we movies. We should. And, all right. Let's do some movies. Let's rock and roll away. Let's talk rocket. about stuff people don't talk about. Okay. Walking Tall trilogy on Blu-ray. Now, Walking Tall is a uh, quite a famous and very popular uh, movie from the 70s. Now, in the 70s, we're talking like Death Wish, you know, uh, uh, society crumbling, New York City about to go bankrupt. And there was sort of a spate of um, kind of vigilante films. Now, Walking Tall is a bit different because it's about a sheriff, but this is not just any sheriff. He's a Buford, sheriff. He's Buford Pusser. He's Buford Pusser, and he's a sheriff who walks around with a baseball bat. And he just take, he just sticks it to the bad guy with a baseball bat. <laughs> I like Joe Don Baker. And it was Joe Don Baker man. playing uh, uh, Buford, Buford uh, Pusser. Pusser. And you know what? This film was a big, big hit at the time. Can't laugh at Walking Tall. It was remade uh, uh, with The Rock. But the thing is that the reason Walking Tall was a hit was because it was the right film at the right time, saying the right thing that society wanted to hear. Same with Death Wish. And that's why it was popular. You can't just make it with The Rock and hope for the best. So there's, uh, the Blu-ray includes Walking Tall Part 2 and Final Chapter Walking Tall. Of course, the only good one is Walking, Walking Tall. Walking Tall. Forget about and, the others. Uh, forget about the others. But you know what? It's on Blu-ray. All three are here. You know what? It's a nice compact package. So if you like one, go ahead and pick up the Blu-ray. Um, I was not a fan of Albert Nobbs. I don't understand this film. This is a. Um, I didn't the, understand. I didn't understand the character of Albert Nobbs. That I, I wasn't is sure. the problem. Was, was she, is, she, is she a little tweaked? Is she gay? Is she just detached from reality? Has she been masquerading as a man too long? I, it, it, that I, is, the, the character was a complete mystery to me. I could not agree more. I, I honestly, I'm watching this film going. I, I get that Glenn Close, uh, uh, who was Oscar nominated for this film, yeah, uh, it means a lot to her. This, she's been trying to get this film made for many years, but as she plays it, I'm thinking I don't. Whatever she sees in the character, other than the challenge of playing a man, I don't know what she sees in this person. I don't. There's no insight in terms of why she does what she does. She's, I agree. She's, she's not only hiding her identity from the people in the film; she winds up hiding it from the audience. I mean, there's no other interior life in her, and frankly, the whole movie just sunk based on, on that basis. So Albert Nobbs is a disappointment. Love Glenn Close, who doesn't? Uh, Janet McTeer, also an Oscar nominated for some reason, I have to say. Well, well you know, she did, uh, Janet McTeer is kind of the heart and soul of the movie, even though her whole kind of padded body suit doesn't look even the least bit realistic. And she, she looks the, like... Uh, the performance is good. She looks like um, Jane Lynch. <laughs> she does. She does, kind of, yeah. Uh, what else we have? We have um, Catherine Heigl, uh, the uh, box office poison of all time, <laughs> and uh, the worst actress who ever lived who needs to just go away and just do something else. Stars in One for the Money. This was a uh, supposed to be a bit of a comeback thing for her. She has a horrible reputation. She makes horrible choices. Uh, and so really this thing wound up uh, being a piece of crap. I remember the reason why this film opened as well as it did was because there was a group on offer. Where like if you saw one, if, if you bought one ticket, you would right. get another one for free, whatever it was, based on a Groupon offer, which mm-hmm. is the only reason why the film did well when it opened. I know. Otherwise, it's just a piece of junk, just like all Catherine Heigl films she are. Just, just a piece TV, of junk. just be a TV actress. She Stop re- trying to be America's sweetheart. She really should. It's just, this is just a dreadful film. Uh, anyway, so one for the money, skip that. Uh, you know, I will talk about Rampart, and I will say that um, my issue with Rampart, which was directed by Owen Moverman, who did the otherwise terrific um, The Messenger, uh, I don't really have a lot of problems with Rampart. I, my problems with Rampart are that it's sort of derivative. It hits a lot of the same beats as is The it, Messenger. And you know what it is? It's, 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 another, it's a bad lieutenant. It's another film yeah, where, exactly. like, 
wow, he's just a, a, an accurate, amoral cop who tells it like it is, and he might be racist, yeah. and I've seen it a thousand times, and I don't know why I care now versus the other 17 times I saw this film. It's true, but it's well done. Yeah, sure. I, I'd like to see him it's stretch handheld. a little. I'd like to see him stretch a little. You know, it's handheld, and there's lots of natural light to give it that kind of a sun-bleached L.A. look. I get that, and of course the guy is uh, horrible. He's arrogant. He's a chauvinist. He's a uh, you know he's he's a sexist. He's a homophobe. I get it. I get it. he's a bad cop. The end. I, I I just feel like I've seen this. Yeah. You know, so I was disappointed in Rampart. Although I'm still interested in Owen Moverman. I I, I would like to, I'm I interested agree. in what he does next. You know, uh, the Devil Inside, inspired by true events, is an exclusive at Best Buy, and uh, I, I don't really know why. I would think they'd want to. Uh, you know, the film the Vatican doesn't want you to see. Uh, I, I would hope that they would d- blow this thing out as fast and far and wide as they possibly can because it's just horrible. It's not very good at all. Um, it, it, the, the whole thing is just another one of those low-budget uh, kind of... Oh, it's just... It's, it's like, I, I, we've seen The Exorcist, man. I've seen it. You know, Everyone has seen it. Everyone's seen these possession movies. This, like In 1972, this thing might have had a little bit of uh, exploitation film cachet, but... I, you know what? It, it, come on, you know, the, the priests and nuns and I was a troll and on demons, I, and it's just uh, possession. Oh gosh, yawn. Seriously, yawn. I trolled this film's website. Can, can I tell you how I trolled this film's website? Yeah. So this film has like a secret. It's supposed. To, it's a, based on a true story, which is a bunch of BS. A bunch of crap. So I go on the website, and there's just hundreds of messages from people saying. Do you think it's really true? Could it really have happened? You know, just, just quote unquote discussing the film. So I logged on yeah. and, I, and 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 I, and I typed in something along, something along the lines of, you know, which member of the production company is <laughs> typing in these phony comments <laughs> to try to make it look like people are contributing to the stupid Sweet. page? Yeah. And I would type that in, I would enter it, I would see it, and then thirty seconds later, it would disappear. How funny. How oh, funny. And I did it like another two, three times, what, and each time it disappeared. Ringers. We, we have a couple of Blu-rays of uh, previous releases from Fox. These are catalog releases. It'll probably go a little bit under the radar, but they are worth mentioning. Uh, Don Bluth did a uh, version of Thumbelina that uh, has been unfairly dismissed, I think. Look, is it The Little Mermaid? No. Is it Beauty and the Beast? No. But it's so nice to revisit a lot of this uh, 2D cell animation at this point where everything is, is you know, CGI animation. And, you know, it's, it, honestly, Don Blue is a hell of an animator. And I think people just unfairly compared him at the time to all this stuff Disney was doing and didn't really kind of uh, give him any credit for the stuff that, that was uniquely his. Anyway, he does a lovely rendition of Thumbelina. It's sweet. In, uh, of course, he does it with Gary Goldman. I, I hate to always give Gary Goldman short shrift because he, he did do all of these with Don Bluth. We could tend to sort of put Don Bluth right out there at the, uh, at the forefront. Uh, some great stuff from uh, Barry Manilow in here, the songs, you know, and the music. Uh, really nicely done. And uh, check it out. It's, uh, it's on Blu-ray, and it's a very nice transfer by Fox. And not so enthralling is Aquamarine, which is um, kind of like uh, taking – it's like a, a, a tweener version of Splash with three mermaids instead of one. And uh, it's a – just stupid movie. Uh, but the only reason that it is sort of worth watching is because uh, this is Emma Roberts' debut, at least the first debut that I'm aware of. And, uh, you know, forget about the commentary. It's totally useless. But um, it's, it's nice to see uh, Emma Roberts in her breakthrough role. Not that she's very good in it, but uh, she's better in subsequent films. But, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a kitsch factor to that. Hello, Wade. Hi, Mark. What do we got there? We have a great uh, Criterion, a must-buy. I, I would agree, even though I still have a problem with the end of the movie. Uh, being John Malkovich was sort of a uh, coming-out party for... Um, really, it was kind of a coming-out party for Charlie Kaufman. Yeah, it was. Uh, and, and, and at least film-wise, uh, Spike Jones. And I'll have to say that uh, John Cusack has never done a better film than this. I, I would agree with that. Even I would. better than say it, whatever, I would. say anything's fine, but yeah. he's never done a better film than this. And I would also say Cameron Diaz has never done a better film than this. Because yeah, okay. someone, like, someone like John Cusack, who's done a lot of work over the years and is always solid, but never really 
gave a great performance, never has done anything really memorable. Uh, who doesn't like him? I get it. You'll name six films he's done, and, 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 I'll, and I'll like all six you name. Whatever, High Fidelity, Gross Point Blank, whatever. I get it. But in terms of like movies that will last, and movies that are wildly original and really stretch him and really are memorable... Being John Malkovich to me is really the only one. You hit the mic. I yeah, did hit the mic. Up. Yes, I did. Anyway, John Ma- uh, uh, John Cusack plays a a, 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 a puppeteer who uh, gets sucked into the mind of John Malkovich, and who hasn't that happened to? Uh, his wife is played by Cameron uh, Diaz, and uh, Cameron Diaz and John Malkovich and and uh, the Catherine Keener character all use Malkovich as kind of a host body. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Malkovich is a great sport. He has a lot of fun with it. It's a terrific film, a lot of surrealism in it. It's just, uh, it's, but it's very sort of, um, what, it, what I like about it is the fact that its surrealism and its oddness is almost casual. It's yeah. not forcing its oddness on you. It's almost like, here's the world, mm-hmm. and this is what happened. My only problem with it is that it goes, like most Charlie Kaufman films, and I can say this about, uh, you know... Adaptation. S- adaptation and Sunshine and, uh, you know, a whole bunch of them, they go on 20 minutes too long. The natural ending presents itself, and then it goes on for another 20 minutes, and it drives me crazy every single time. But uh, that is a lovely Blu-ray. It's a, a great Blu-ray. Blu-ray. It's got a lot of um, great special features, including a conversation between uh, John Malkovich and John Hodgman from uh, The Daily Show. We always love him. Yeah. Uh, documentary by uh, Lester ba- uh, Lant, not Lester Bangs. Uh, <laughs> documentary by uh, filmmaker Lance Bangs. A terrific uh, five point one surround uh, uh, audio transfer. Really good stuff. Um, I like this film a lot. Spike Jones approved. Buy it. Being John Malkovich. I uh, got a bunch of Warner Archive films. I'm going to go through real quickly. Uh, Raquel Welch, always good in absolutely anything from the uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, 50s, 90s, uh, I, anything ever. You name it. Uh, this is a, an obscure Raquel Welch film that's not very good, actually, but she's just so gorgeous to look at, you got to recommend it. It's called Flare Up, and um, the, it's one of those obscure kind of easily forgotten late 60s uh, thrillers that sort of come crime, come horror, quasi-horror film. Uh, they, all of these things are sort of... Um, oh, what's the uh, the Audrey Hepburn film? Uh, afraid of the Dark? Uh, oh, Don't Be Afraid of the don't Dark? Don't Be Afraid of the Dark, thank you. It, they, they're all sort of inspired by that in a way and a little bit influenced, I think, by Rosemary's Baby. They wanted to all kind of get the Polanski thing going. So... That all, and of course Hitchcock, late late Hitchcock, Psycho era and uh, Family Plot era Hitchcock. Everybody's everybody's kind of getting in on frenzy, right? So um, that's sort of where this comes from, and uh, is basically you know a crazy guy who uh, who murders his wife uh, now makes Raquel Welch, who plays a Vegas showgirl, the uh, you know the, the the next object of his scorn and his his psycho- psychosis. Anyway. Um, really, the only interesting thing about this, I think, is that you see a lot of cool shots of L.A. from the period, which is sort of neat. You go, oh, my gosh, I know where that parking lot used to be. That's a building now. So that stuff always kind of intrigues me. And then also from the Warner Archive collection, and remember all this stuff is available at warnerarchive.com. It's, uh, these are DVD-Rs, not uh, regular press DVDs. They're a little bit cheaper. Quality's a little bit less, but you do get them uh, M O. D, Manufacture on Demand. This is the Maisie Collection, Volume 1, uh, starring Anne Southern. Now, if you're not familiar with these, this includes the following films. Maisie, Congo Maisie, Gold Rush Maisie, Maisie Was a Lady, and Ringside Maisie. And I know a lot of film buffs out there are thinking, Maisie? What the hell is Maisie? Uh, if you've heard of Anne Southern, you should have heard of Maisie. This is, uh, Maisie's a showgirl. We we're just talking about Raquel Welch playing a showgirl. Well... Maisie was a different kind of showgirl. And uh, this series was hugely popular for about 10 seconds, and then nobody gave a damn anymore. But uh, you know what? It, uh, back in the 30s, this was a big deal. So uh, if you are an Anne Southern fan, definitely check it out. If you're not, 
forget about it. This is volume one, plenty more to come. I can't believe how many Maisie films there were. It's just this is like it vanished. It's amazing. Oh, man, I knew you were going to go there. And then lastly, three films that have gone to the uh, the archive collection by Blake Edwards. I'm kind of surprised that these are now manufacture on demand because at least one of these, the one I'm going to talk about right now, deserves to be uh, a much more respected film. That's SOB. Um, Blake Edwards' SOB is still one of the quintessential films about the movie business, about the entertainment business. And even though it's a little bit dated, uh, it you know, 1981, it just it still is so insightful and incisive, and it hits on so many painful points. I'm just shocked that they would uh, toss this off to you know, manufacture on Demandville. And Julie Andrews. She goes topless. Yes, she does. It's not a pretty sight. She she flashes what she's got. Yeah, she shouldn't. And have done this is that. the sound of music, Julie Andrews. Yep. Who is married to Blake Edwards? Yes. So um, obviously he got her to do it. Uh, Blake Edwards by Edward, probably uh, withholding sex if she didn't, speaking, or possibly offering sex if she. Speaking of speaking of sex, uh, Blake Edwards' Skin Deep is one of the worst films he ever made. John Ritter is is always very funny. And he kind of does his Jack Tripper, Three's Company routine in this. But I got to tell you, th- this movie was famous for one thing and one thing only. And it's the only reason to watch this, which is the glow-in-the-dark the, in the condom gag. And it just ain't that funny. It just isn't. It's just not that funny. And then lastly, uh, Victor Victoria, which was uh, Oscar-nominated. Um, you know, no, this... that does not... That, that is an Oscar-nominated film. I, in fact, the first scene of that film... Remember when she puts the cockroach yes. in the salad? Yes. I still dream of doing that. It is a very good film. I have to say, this belongs on Blu-ray. Yes, it, it does. It really should be on Blu-ray. Yes. This shouldn't. Yeah, and this Robert this, Preston. Yeah. Hilarious. I know. I know. This belongs on Blu-ray. Uh, I I kind of understand why they threw it to uh, the Warner Archive thing because the the the, the, po- the film nobody knows about this film anymore. It's kind of lost its luster. I mean, I know I hear people talk about Sob a lot still. SOB's regularly cited. Victor Victoria was like a great film at the moment. It's kind of lost its luster, so I'm surprised. I understand why they're doing it, but I'm surprised that they're not trying to, re- you know, put a little bit of money behind it and reinvent its uh, its relevance again because it did become a big deal on Broadway. They did Victor Victoria as a, as a musical on Broadway as well. So I, I'd like to see them uh, put this on Blu-ray eventually. So you know, go to WarnerArchive.com and, and email uh, Warner Brothers and tell them to get on their. Get on the case and get this thing on Blu-ray. But anyway, Robert Preston is great. James Garner is great. Julie Andrews is great. Uh, you know, it is, that's, it's one of it, Blake Edwards' most honored and respected films. I really. like that film a lot. Yeah. I think it's terrific. Yeah. And War- Leslie Ann Warren's in it, too. Yeah. And by the way, so is Alex Karras. Leslie Ann Warren, who, uh, who uh, was once involved romantically with John uh, Peters. Gilgood. John Peters. Gilgood. Has a son by him. <laughs> who used to come to the Man National Theater all the time when I worked there. Yeah. I think he's producing stuff now. Uh, Joe Carnahan uh, directs the uh, big film of the week, I guess. I guess it's the big release of the week, although maybe being John Malkovich is better. But I'm saying The Gray. Oh, yeah, The Gray. Finally out. Liam Neeson is having a uh, mid, mid to mid-career reinvention as an action hero. And uh, I love Taken. Taken's a great film. Love it. It's just a big 90-minute blast of insanity, which I thoroughly enjoy. This I do not enjoy as much. Uh, here you have... Um, Neeson playing a guy who survives a plane crash in the Alaskan wilderness, and him and a bunch of oil drillers have to, uh, you know, find safety, and of course there's a pack of, uh, you know, wolves and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's a film, there's a David Mamet film called The Edge with Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin, Uh and that's like another survival thing. Same kind of deal. I like that film better because Mamet uses that conceit to get into what it is to be a man and manliness Mm. and machismo and and how and how guys try to one up each other and be, become territorial even when there's a survival at stake. I like that film, The Edge, uh, better than The Gray. Uh, you know, there's some good stuff in it. Joe Carnahan definitely has a flair for you know muscular action, but uh, I was not that impressed. And lastly, we've got Chronicle. Uh, not much to say about this. This was a, a hit for about two weeks when all the fanboys ran out to it. Chronicle basically ate one of those first-person found footage movies, except it combined with a superhero film, uh, a bunch of kids who uh, discover some kind of extraterrestrial 
buried spacecraft, which suddenly makes them able to fly and do all kinds of things telekinetically. And next thing you know, they're turning into uh, lunatics and they're tossing cars and creating mayhem and wrecking everything in the city. And it's like the finale to the Avengers with these three kids who've lost control. Well, two of them have gone, you know, are on the good, and one of them's gone completely ape crazy. And uh, they completely abandon the found footage concept at the end of the movie just for all the thrills and pyrotechnics. Um, you know, it's, it's okay until it just goes off the rails. But uh, the found footage thing, getting really old and tired, looks nice on, uh, on Blu-ray. It's a Blu-ray DVD combo and uh, certainly a pile of, you know, very superficial extras. Two different cuts on here that make no difference whatsoever. Don't be seduced by it. And uh, there's a digital copy on here, too, for some strange reason. Not that, not, not the uh, ultraviolet, though. So, uh, anyway, Chronicle, worth a rental, probably. Uh, nice transfer, nice audio, but, you know, you can only go so far with the found footage stuff. And that's it, Mark. We will be back next week with more Voxbox and emails. Emails at godsatdigigods.com. Mark, yes? Soda crackers, one-third a cup of canola oil, uh, one pack of Hidden Valley Ranch dressing, two no, tablespoons of no, uh, red pepper no. flakes, or uh, uh, Parmesan cheese. Mix it all together. Drizzle it over the crackers. Put it in there for t- in a container for two days. Turn it up and down every uh, every uh, a couple times a day to make sure that all the crackers get infused with the canola oil and red pepper and fresh and dressing goodness, and then eat it and love it. <laughs>